Welcome, you're listening to Jay's Analysis, a little bit different this go-round. We're going to have two different segments. We're going to deal with Q&A. I asked readers and listeners to send Q&A questions. I get so many emails, I can't keep up with them, and it's just constantly people asking for book recommendations and questions and this and that. And what do you think of this, and why don't you do an analysis of this obscure movie that no one has ever seen but two people in Romania? So... Jamie is then, after all that, going to talk with me about Hollywood hoodoo. Yes, the Hollywood voodoo movies. And we picked about the top four or five that really stand out. And some of those I remember from the 80s and 90s kind of freaked me out when I was in high school going to see Serpent in the Rainbow, things like that. So we're going to talk about Hollywood voodoo movies. But first we're going to do Q&A. And you're going to answer some Q&A too? I hope so, if I have an answer. You need to be confident. And <laughs> even if you don't have an answer, you just bullshit and make up that you do. Well, that's what people do on those man in the street um, mm-hmm. things where they try to make everyone look stupid by asking fifth grade questions and no one knows the answer. Um, I saw one. Someone was trying to make everyone agree to a vote for Hillary because she wanted Sharia law for women. And no one knew what that was. So they just said, yeah, it sounds like a great thing. So I I think you're allowed to not know things and ask questions and not have an answer. I think that's part of the, of, of a problem that people mm-hmm. Right. Well, for a lot of these questions, I have the answer. Oh, good. Some of these aren't really questions. I asked for questions and I got people requesting segments which is not a question but that's why I intentionally said that smart ass answers will follow (laughs) so the first question comes from Justin and is it coke or pepsi uh the response false dialectic that's a that's a false choice Justin the correct answer is bubba cola and yes there is such a thing as bubba cola in the south (laughs) Jamie coke or pepsi well, I like Cactus Cooler myself, what but it's like a, it's just another fruit drink, soft drink, but... Is that what you crazies on the West Coast drink? Uh, yeah. Are you talking about Coke to drink or Coke to clean you your toilet? Coke and Pepsi. Yeah, it's just... Oh, so Coke, that's right, you told me that Coca-Cola will actually clean the toilet. But it's just like Hillary or Donald Trump, mm-hmm. right? One or the other, and both of them are horrible. All right, next question from Lee. Does the gay mafia run the hip-hop industry? I would say there's some good arguments for that. It sure seems like it. I mean, if you watch enough YouTube videos, a lot of these ex-rappers and things are putting out that definitely that is part of the process of getting famous. In mm-hmm. that. I know that when my budding hip-hop career was reaching a certain level, <laughs> they asked me if I would be gay with both Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff. Um, excuse me, that's the same dude, isn't it? No. Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff no, and the Fresh Prince. No, they're two different, yeah. The, DJ Jazzy Jeff. That's right. His friend. Well, but Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince are like alternate. It's like Hannah Montana. Really? No. No, wait. Will Smith and the Fresh Prince. Yes. It's like Hannah Montana. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> But uh, I would say, yeah, because they didn't let me in it, and I'm not gay, so I, there you go. I think it's called the Lavender Mafia or something like that, or what is that? Well, that's just the gay mafia, uh-huh. but I think he's asking if there's one that runs hip-hop. Specifically in hip-hop. Well, it is kind of weird the way that Will Smith kisses his son. Have you ever seen videos of that? Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, it's really gross. And I'm not... I'm, I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm not feeling too great. So I'm going to try to answer these questions as to the best of my human potential abilities. So the next one is from Jason. On Boiler Room, you said your parents are friends with Hank Jr. Do you agree that the song Friday Night's a Great Night for Football from The Last Boy Scout is a much better football theme song than All My Rowdy Friends? And the answer is no. The correct answer is that the since you mentioned last boy scout is that the return of bruno which is bruce willis's album if you remember that from the 80s bruno remember that return of bruno yeah i played you bruce willis songs oh yeah 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 all right so he mentioned last boy scout and he forgot 
the correct answer is Bruno's album. So that's the best song ever in the world, actually, of all time, is Bruce Willis's. All right, next question is from uh, Jason again. What do you think about Tony Scott and Last Boy Scout and True Romance? Uh, those are good movies that uh, Last Boy Scout, I think, if I recall, has some mind control element to it, predictive programming, but it's been so many years since I watched that that I don't recall. But what do you, do you recall Last Boy Scout? No, but True Romance, we watched. Oh, that's a Tarantino movie, but no, we didn't watch it. We didn't. Oh, yeah. I no. <laughs> uh, let's see. Next question. Jim Smith. String theory, yes or no? Uh, depends on how you cut the cheese. If you cut the cheese with a grater, no. If you get, if you pull it off with your fingers, it is stringy. I don't know much about it. String theory. I would say yes. Okay, that's that question. Uh, do you know the Muffin Man? Um, yes, I know the Muffin Man, and he. Uh, uh, I, I don't. I was trying to think of something funny, but I, I'm blank on that one. <laughs> Who are these questions these coming are from? Fans. Oh. The millions of fans. Uh huh. Do you know the Muffin Man? I don't. Okay, next one. Um. Shillery or the Trumpinator? Uh, Trumpinator. Well, only because he's more entertaining. He's he's a Harambe was going to be VP. Okay, <laughs> fabulous guy, wonderful. But Hillary is now more of the uh, physical comedian because she keeps on falling over and making funny faces and having little seizures and definitely not reacting appropriately to things that are in the news. The next question from Vishnu. I guess this is from the actual Hindu god. How many Jason Bournes are there? Well, that's a trick question. Do you mean the literal name Jason Bourne? There's probably 10,000 or 15,000 Jason Bournes. Do you mean how many MK Ultra assassins are there? I have no idea. Probably not very many. How many Jason Bourne movies are there? I think they're on the fifth. Are they? I've only seen three. Okay. In your research, which nation will eventually be seen as dominating the 21st century? Uh, there won't be any nations dominating the 21st century because nation states, as we see in the movie Network with Howard Beale, screaming, uh, being screamed at that you believe in nation states and so we'll be in the trans uh, national corporation dominance era where there aren't really nation states except as fronts. Next question. That was from Darren. Uh, if evil is characterized by selfish individualism, this is from Cyril, then how do evil oligarchs manage to work together? Wouldn't there be limitations on their power and purpose? I would say that you could look at, for example, the New Testament where Herod and Pontius Pilate, both evil and presumably not the best of pals, uh, we even read that in the Gospels, uh, unite in their rejection of Jesus in the Gospels. So the means by which evil is union, uh, unionized, the evil, <laughs> the unions of evil, Satan has his uh, workers' unions, uh, it would be also seen the Tower of Babel incident. If you read Genesis 10, 11, and 12, uh, evil is unified in its rebellion against God. So it's through Satan. That's true. Um, but I think they also only just work with each other when it benefits them. Um and a lot of times they... Well, the world is united in rebellion against yeah, God. That's true. But I thought you were talking about corporations and heads of state and things like that. Well, he is talking about that, but I'm saying that they're under the influence of evil. Oh, true. So that's how they're unified in Lucifer, even if they don't know that they serve Lucifer. Very true. Um, why am I not satisfied? This is from Matthew. Why am I not satisfied with lack of dead communists under my porch? Well, that's because you have uh, very high expectations, so... How many dead communists under your porch will it take before you're happy? I don't know. That's a question that you have to look inside to answer. Uh, next question from Mark. Yoga sees all reality as essentially immaterial in substance, while Orthodox and Eastern Christianity sees reality as composed of multiple essences, some immaterial and some material. True or false? That would be true. Would it make sense that the yogic rejection of the material world 
is derivative of their monistic scheme, yes, while orthodoxy's acceptance of the material world stems from a dualistic scheme. And that is from Mark. The reply is that no, dualism is not a feature of uh, Eastern Christianity either. So neither monism nor dualism are proposed as dialectical tensions. And in fact, uh, dialectics is rejected by uh, Eastern philosophy, Eastern Orthodox philosophy. So no dualism. That's exactly why many of the philosophers of the Eastern tradition say that the Trinity or the triad uh, transcends dual dualism and duality. Next question. If you could, would you post a reading list of books that you recommend on geopolitics, secret societies, drug trafficking, international banking? Um, that's really difficult. I know that a lot of people have, I get a lot of emails for book recommendations. The problem is that it's very difficult to narrow down a lot of books on all of these different topics to five or ten. Because as soon as you pick five, then there's one other one that should be the sixth. And then when you pick ten, there should be eleven and also the other authors that you know that might be your friends are like, hey, why didn't you include my book? You're supposed to be my friend and help me promote my stuff. So it gets really complicated and complex when you try to figure out which books you want to pick. And then sometimes there's a, an essay, a scholarly essay that might not be easy to find that should be on the list. So it's a really difficult thing to pick a specific list of books. But I mean, if you want to do geopolitics, go for Tragedy and Hope. That's that's a key key piece of uh, text to read if you want to do secret societies uh, Michael Hoffman's secret societies and psychological warfare drug trafficking and the relationship with terror and intelligence agencies you want to do shadow masters by Daniel Estelin <clears throat> international banking cartels uh, probably tragedy and hope still would rank at the top of that one um, but yeah, so that's not, not an easy one to do, but I am trying to work on that and we'll try in some way in the future to get a kind of book list going. Jamie, do you have a book list recommendation? Of course, Jamie would recommend her books. That's true, but not really on any of those subjects. That's not my strong well, Yeah, but thing. go ahead and promote your books. Oh yeah, so I got Weird Stuff, Operation Culture Creation, Part 1 and 2, and Hollywood Mind Control. All very good books for introducing you to all ranges of topics and maybe even some that you mentioned before next question darren darren jay have you ever had an experience that was a supernatural event or mystical that gave you confirmation that god and divine intelligence exists yes i had a badass acid trip when i was 18 and saw what i believed to be a devil and i thought that i died and i don't think that it was just a figment of my imagination i think that it was something spiritual and i think that it was a dark thing and that was a very dark time in my life with uh, bad stuff going on at home and so forth. And so, yes, that is, I would not consider that a total proof of why I would believe in God or the spiritual realm, but that was an important event that I do take to be uh, in a dark way supernatural. So that's part of the reason I don't recommend hallucinogens as uh, any kind of way to short path or quick, quick way to enlightenment or anything like that. Well, for me, I guess that depends on how you divine supernatural or mystic because I've definitely had instances in my life where miracles have happened and I know that there's no way that that could ever have come about if I didn't have angels or God or something else looking out for me. I've always been taken care of and rescued and um, carried through calamities by divine intervention, something I could have never have planned, and I know that God exists. Next question from Sarah. What is your take on Flatland by Edwin Abbott? Well, if you, that is proof that we live on a flat earth. Not really, I'm joking. We live on a giant pizza crust, <laughs> and the ice wall is like the crust of the pizza, pizza that surrounds the earth, the flat earth. No. <laughs> Uh, Flatland is great because it shows us uh, dimensions. It's basic geometry that shows the one, two, three dimensions, and then presumably the fourth dimension, which we call hypercube or tesseract, which I talk about quite a bit in different articles. So, uh, yeah, that's a great Victorian-era novel to read, Flatland. Uh, next question. What is the amount of research you have done on the future view of humanity? 
uh, a return to caves. Mm, I will be, I already live in a cave. So I, I choose to live in a cave so that I can more readily experience the reality of what it is to understand Plato. And so every morning when I get up and I walk outside my cave, I feel like I'm Socrates <laughs> coming out into the light. And then I go back into the cave and hopefully Jamie's hanging out in the cave and I tell her about all of the great celestial luminous luminaries outside and that she should come and unchain herself from watching the old rep, uh, reruns of Cosby show on the <laughs> phantasms of the cave wall. <laughs> Next question from Dean. Which big picture thinker are you most impressed with today? And part two, who is your mentor intellectually? Uh, hmm, big picture thinker. I guess I would probably pick somebody in geopolitics. I guess maybe Alexander Dugan is good for somebody who, I mean, there just aren't very many people out there today who combine philosophy and geopolitics and the esoteric and metaphysics and all of that into one thing. And that's what would be required for me to think somebody was interesting. And, you know, we live in an age when there's just not a lot of wisdom out there. So I guess for big picture geopolitical thinkers probably Dugan would be one of the one of the top ones who is your mentor intellectually I don't think I have a single intellectual mentor obviously over the years a lot of different writers and thinkers and philosophers have influenced me like St. Augustine uh, City of God or Cornelius Van Til in Van Til's Apologetic uh, or Plato in his uh, dialogues or uh, Aristotle's metaphysics or Moses in the uh, Old Testament, uh, the New Testament as well. Um, Dr. Philip Sherrard has definitely influenced me. St. Maximus the Confessor is a big influence. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa in his big long book against Eunomius is very influential for me. And um, maybe Edmund Husserl would be an influence as well for philosophy and math and, and refuting scientism. And um, I'm sure there's more. Uh, Dr. Joseph P. Farrell's uh, big treatise, God, History, and Dialectic, is very important for the way I view things. And Jamie, what are your influences and mentors? Hmm. Well, it, it always changes uh, from era to era in your life. And right now I'm reading Manly P. Hall's Adventures in Understanding and getting a lot out of that. But um, I guess my intellectual mentor would be the person that I am spending the most time with, and that's you. I learn a lot. Oh, wow. That's sweet. Yeah. Well, I just cut and paste everything from Wikipedia, <laughs> so, so your mentor is Wikipedia. Just kidding. What do you think of Miles Mathis? Uh, some good articles, but he goes too far. That was from Purick. Uh, some of it is just like way over the top. Michelle. Uh, what do you think of Stefan Molyneux? I did a whole two-hour podcast on Stefan. I'm not a big fan. I think he's fundamentally contradictory, though he has insights at times. <clears throat> Is your uncle Ted Turner really promoting the Nazi metrosexual lifestyle? It's my granddad, Ted Turner, not my uncle, and yes. Next question. Uh... Have you... This is from Calvin. Have you reached the state where nothing has validity? Unless it is a cult, the cultists would have it so. I don't understand the question, and so I'm going to say yes. <laughs> why do you have, why do I have two Austin Powers uh, International Man of Mystery DVDs? That's from Lane. The answer is because that's the best movie from the 2000s, or is that from the 90s? I think early 2000s. Okay. I like the Austin Powers with Beyonce myself. Mm -hmm. I think that's the Austin Powers is the only movie that came out that year. So that's why you have two <laughs> DVDs. I hate PayPal. Can I send a check? Yes, you can always send me checks. Let's see. Uh, J.F. Chaffont. Chaffont. Jeff Chaffont. Is J.F. Do you pronounce that? Jeff. Mm -hmm. Like peanut butter? Yeah. Jiffy Chaffont. 
do you think it is the black house of the order at Yale that is supposedly plundering humanity? The 322. They are probably the house that you don't want to mess with. Uh, yes, Skull and Bones is Lodge 322, and they have a lot of power in terms of the West, uh, the Atlanticist Eastern Coast establishment. So they have a lot of power with, when it comes to drug networks, and that's the founders of CIA, the Spooks. So yes, Lodge 322 is very powerful. Uh, you should do an analysis of Reefer Madness. That would be interesting. This is from Kelly. Yes, it would. And we just have to purchase a giant block of marijuana to smoke <laughs> while we watch it so that we understand it. I love the new musical Reefer Madness. I recommend it to everyone. If you get the DVD, it also has the old classic black and white uh, version that it's based on. But the new musical is hilarious and you'll love it. Zos.org. Uh, a cult government. The Nazis were a cult governments. Right? An occult government. Do we have one now? Bohemian Groove, uh, did Hillary sacrifice chickens to Moloch? <laughs> um, Hillary is Moloch, and we should all <laughs> sacrifice chickens to her as the incarnation of Moloch. And yes, we have an occult government. Well, that comes up in Voodoo, which we're going to be talking about. Yeah, so, <laughs> Zos, that's a great question. Dave, what research have you found that surprised you the most? Um, probably either chemtrails or AI or the immense level of coordination between the CIA government and Hollywood. What three areas surprise you the most? Oh man. Surprising is when I picked up a, a book by Kurt Barker and it was all about his time as a little lady boy in the Illuminati and he was raised in it and it goes into cannibalism and all these crazy uh, tales and trails of true goings on inside the dark Illuminati and I was surprised by that. What book it's is that? Called, um, Kurt Barker, like blood drinking, cannibalism and the Illuminati. Just Google Kurt Barker and it'll come okay. up. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> this is from Dave. What is your favorite subject to research? Mine is metaphysics and theology. My favorite subject? Oh, man. All of them. All the subjects. Yes. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite is all the subjects. A favorite of mine, I guess, is like nature. Okay. Yeah. Um, flat earth or hollow earth? Uh, neither. Cube earth. Um, the Earth is a giant cube. It's more like a gobstopper. Ru Rubik's cube Earth. Yeah, it's like everlasting gobstopper. Tetrahedron Earth. That was from Ish, Ish Garcia. Um, Selena? Question mark. Is her father an Illuminate connection? And I said I'm not up on. Selena, Jamie probably is. I don't know. Is Selena Illuminate? <laughs> she, they made a movie about her with Jennifer Lopez. She was assassinated pretty young. No, Selena Gomez, not Selena, oh, the Selena Mexican Gomez. singer. Oh, I don't know about that either. Okay, uh, as a man that this is from Darren again, as a man that appreciates many aspects of art, what are your three favorites? What are my three favorite aspects of art or three favorite artists or arts or <laughs> I would say uh, form, <laughs> order and harmony and beauty. That's my favorite three things of art can be from literature to cinema to television. Well, it's not TV. I can tell you that uh, I like music and I like film. And I like uh, religious iconography. My favorite kind of art is art made from trash. Anything that has been recycled and put to a better use, you know. If you so you're like Nick from Family Ties. <laughs> I, I, I love anything like I. Nick made all of his art from trash. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've. Um, but you can create beautiful things out of things that people throw away, and you might think it's disposable, but anything can be used for art if you have an imagination. I've seen walls covered with colorful bottle caps that made a pattern in a rainbow in it well yeah. you should submit your ideas to dave rockefeller he would love it he I would, would think you're so green and eco-friendly 
To what extent is game theory driving the seemingly insane U.S. policy? Uh, a very large extent, and I have several articles that discuss um, game theory and mathematics and rational choice theory, and you can find all those at Jay's Analysis, and that's all out of the RAND Corporation. Uh, let's see. What would be the orthodox concept of would what would the orthodox concept of symphonia look like in the U.S.? It would not look like anything because it would not work. That was from David. The U.S. Uh, structure of government, I don't think, is at all um, blendable or workable with uh, classical orthodox tradition because it, the America is built on the Enlightenment, which is fundamentally opposed to all the orthodox ideas of uh, church and state. I would like to see you do an analysis of flat earth. Mm, probably not. Boring and dumb. Uh, let's see. That was from Kelly. What do you think of Electric Universe Theory? Jason, I think it has a lot of really interesting ideas and probably is in the right direction much better than atomistic materialism from Newton. Um, let's see. Is that all in this section? Theology, East and West. Well, that is very broad. Uh, I vote East. Did Hitlery Shitton create ISIS from our old friend Lloyd Johnson? Yes. Uh, in a sense, she did. She was involved as head of the State Department in recrafting and rebranding Al-Qaeda into ISIS. But, of course, Al-Qaeda goes back much further to 1978 and 79 with Zbigniew Brzezinski and Jimmy Carter. Uh, next question. Michael. Uh, do an analysis of Burning Man. It seems to be a cult. Well, it it is. <laughs> Quite blatantly so. Yeah, we'll be coming out with analysis of Wicker Man soon. A little shorty. Mm -hmm. I will be a little shorty? Yeah, a <laughs> shorty analysis. I will be playing movie. the role of Nick Cage. Uh, burning up with rage. <laughs> Cage rage. Very good. Is physical money... This is Stefan. Not Stefan for Sunday Night Live and not Stefan Molyneux. Uh, is physical cash money disappearing? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, what is the purpose? The purpose is to convert everybody over to electronic currency so that they can be controlled and tracked and traced in even greater measure. What is the origin of the human race? Uh, Genesis and creation. That is from Gustavo. Um, and I believe that Genesis is accurately describing the creation of man through God. And I have a lot of arg arguments and articles that refute and argue against Darwinism. Uh, what it, let's see, yes, Stefan said, will you include my question? Yes, I did include your question. Next, we move over to all of the Twitter questions. And the first one is from Travis. Can a non-Christian conspiracy uh, flagger have a solution to all these overarching issues or just point them out? Uh, I would gen generally tend to say just point them out because they're not going to give much of a worldview that can really explain the totality of uh, the problem. Uh, next question is from Martin. Can mysticism successfully oppose technology? Hmm, good question. E yeah, in a sense, because ultimately technology is still dealing with the realm of the material and the virtual and the phantasmical. I'm making up new words here. And the human soul will never be satiated with phantasms and material forms. It's always going to require and seek something more. And so I would say, depending on what you mean by mysticism, yes, techno-nihilism, or tech-nihilism as I call it, will not ultimately satisfy man's heart. Do you have a question? Will, will mysticism beat technologism? Mind over matter, I guess. This is from Hugh. Is Putin a player or being played in the East-West dialectic? Uh, I would say that it looks to me like a lot of Putin's actions show that he really is opposing the Western oligarchs. And I think that's uh, beneficial to him and the Russian people. Uh, but I also agree that Dugan's analysis of what's going on makes a lot of sense, too, that you pretty much have amongst the political and moneyed elite in Russia a pro atlanticist faction that has a lot of power and weight and influence tied into the Fortune 500 and the Western establishment. And so they are, you know, of course, constantly trying to engineer Russia into the New World Order. But you have a large number of people in Russia 
that are anti New World Order, and that's the crucial key here, not so much uh, one figure, Putin or whoever. Um, let's see, next question. Scrolling through. What was the first album that you ever bought? The first album I bought was, well, somebody gave me Bismarcky tape that had picking boogers <laughs> on it. And he put, he said he put a booger on the basketball and passed it to him. <laughs> And the first album I bought, I think, was a CD of 90s rap hits with PM Dawn on it. That was from Media Monarchy, our friend James Evan Pilato. Jamie, what was the first album you bought? Um, probably as a child, I bought these tapes called Patch the Pirate that had Christian songs and stories on them. Um, the first secular album I was ever allowed to buy was Paula Abdul <laughs> Spellbound which is pretty dark if you think about it, but after that it was all Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston and um, all the pop divas of the 90s. That was what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there's a few more. I think I've scrolled past some of these because it's hard to keep up with Twitter. such a constant feed of replies and gobbledygook that I can't really keep up with all of these, but... I think we've answered most people's questions, hopefully to the enjoyment of their funny bones. Um, let's see what's up next. We're going to begin our discussion of Hollywood voodoo or Hollywood hoodoo. And Jamie did a lot of research on this, so I think it's going to be going to be fun. I did some a little bit of analysis myself, and we're going to talk about these movies. And Jamie's chosen first this crazy film, The Believers, which actually does kind of show quite a bit about elite interest and fascination in the occult mm -hmm. and specifically in santeria so yeah the believers not to be confused with the believers justin bieber's fan club mm -hmm. no <laughs> but, not not not, not to be confused them. with that but the believers is a 1987 movie um really good era for making movies it looks really um crisp and the i think they did a really good job in making a horror movie out of this one and portraying Santeria in a positive and negative way. Mm. So this film was based on the 1982 book called The Religion mm -hmm. by Nicholas Conde and the movie opens with an African voodoo ceremony where they are doing a child sacrifice. Yeah, I remember that. That was pretty crazy to see that right away at the beginning of the film. You're like, whoa, yeah. dude. Yeah. And so cut away to the next scene, you're in your typical suburban um, household, and this is the wackiest final destination type death of the mother in a movie I've seen, where she's making a pot of coffee, and Martin Sheen, the husband, spills mm -hmm. some milk on the floor, and the coffee pot is malfunctioning, and she touches it while standing barefoot in the milk, and gets electrocuted right in front of her kid at the breakfast table so, so first you have a child sacrifice and then the death of the mother and you have a rube goldberg machine of spiritual death <laughs> set into motion exactly and so this is something i always point out because i see it all the time and i really think it's part of a bigger spiritual issue in popular culture and in the world and if you want to know more about that um i have a whole chapter on that topic in culture creation part two okay so then after this traumatic death, uh, Martin Sheen is playing a psychologist and following the death you know, of his wife, he moves to New York City and takes on a job as a therapist for the New York City Police Department. Right? And one of his patients is an officer who has been working undercover. Right infiltrating a cult and now lives in fear of black magic and martin sheen's trying to tell him it's all in his mind now they were working with a community like kids yeah kids we'll stuff, get to right? that okay yeah because not even all the intense stares of martin sheen mm -hmm. can keep him safe from santeria and so one day he's out playing with his son in central park and they stumble on the site of a ritual sacrifice of some animals, including a little cat. 
And so in preparation for the show, I read a book called The Santeria Experience. Mm -hmm. And in it, the author tells a story about something similar that happened in 1980 in New York City. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a true story. It was in the news and everything. Where the ASPCA raided an apartment in New York City where a ritual sacrifice was taking place and confiscated a bunch of chickens and goats and hamsters. So this is kind of out in the public right before this guy writes the book called The Religion and then it's in the Believer's movie. So um, this also was kind of loosely linked to another story where an actual young boy was found hanging upside down from a tree in the park in New York City. Oh, wow. And then two other bodies were found in the same area that all had the signs of ritualistic murder. And mm-hmm. that is the cases that he's following throughout the movie. And what, um, what era is this? What time period? 1980s. Okay. Um, and so Martin Sheen is kind of adopted by the cops and to follow these crime scenes where they keep finding the, these bodies. You remember one in the docks and one in the park. And so this is following true stories. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I'm not saying that this is Santeria per se, but that's the way they're portraying it. I don't think anybody who's a Santero would um, condone human sacrifice. That's not really what they're about, to be fair. Maybe you could give us just a brief little breakdown Mm -hmm. at the beginning for people listening. What's the difference between voodoo and Santeria? Um, Okay, yeah, that's all in my notes as we progress through the, the movies. Okay. So... But basically, um, it just depends on what African tribe it originated from. Right. And where they migrated to and how that mixed with the local culture, mixed with Catholicism. And then you get these different branches of Santeria, Voodoo, Obeya, Hoodoo, and the like. Okay. So, um, in the scene where they find the cat in the park, the little boy also finds a carved cowrie shell at the site and keeps it. And this is his little, he calls it his wishing shell. Now, the um, cowrie shells in the Santeria is like one of the most important um, divination systems. Now, why is it a shell? Does it matter? Is there a reason for that? Um, They use the shell because most of them were coastal and island places where they use shells for different things. No, Afro-Caribbean stuff. Yeah. And so when um, a Santero is initiated into the religion, he gets 18 shells for every Orisha, which are the spirits of Santeria. And they're also identified with the saints of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And these little white shells, you know, they make necklaces out of them sometimes, but um, they have a ridge of tiny teeth and Mm -hmm. that looks like a little mouth. And so in magic, if something looks like another thing... It has the powers of that thing, so they speak because they have a little mouth. Yeah, it's called the Doctrine of Correspondences, Uh right. And so the spirits speak through the pattern when the shells are cast. So divination. uh Uh-huh, and so this is like practice in Santeria, but it also has things in common with I Ching and um, also computers because it's a a binary type of thing. Oh, right, Uh yeah. And in one form, there's a series of circles and lines that form patterns and that are interpreted by Yoruba. So that's an African tribe that Santeria incorporates Mm -hmm. or it comes from. And they're interpreted by Yoruba parables. So they use this binary system many centuries before computers were ever even thought of. Okay. So it's definitely a well thought out and has some type of power behind it, Mm -hmm. right? So then, back in the movie, the next crime scene they come across is an actual child sacrifice. Mm-hmm. In the, yeah, I remember that. In the theater, right. nonetheless, right? And so, you know, although human sacrifice is not really uh, part of voodoo or santuary, it would kind of be naive to think that it doesn't happen ever anywhere, because that is a powerful black magic way of getting things that you want. Right. Right? And we're especially when you're talking about high-ranking, powerful people, which is this movie is about. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the money delete. Now, what's the number one message from this? Don't stand in milk and touch a coffee pot at the same time. (laughs) If you watch this movie. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, a while ago when I was researching voodoo for weird stuff, 
I read a book called Blood Secrets by Isaiah Oki where he um, remembers his upbringing as the grandson and a successor of an important Baba Larisha, they mm -hmm. call him, and high priest in West Africa, and he claims that there are ceremonies for the public that are benign and things that they're used to, and then there are different ones that higher initiates so an do in secret. So an exoteric and an esoteric. Exactly, mm -hmm. and so the higher up in, the louder you get, the tighter knit the circle you get, and that's where you get the more um, things like human sacrifice, right? Mm-hmm. I would say so. Yeah. So um, the thing I found interesting about that book, Blood Secrets, was that the trials he had to go through during his initiation as a, chi a child mirror um, classic trauma-based mind control techniques. Mm, right. Such as um, sleep and food deprivation and isolation and physical abuse. Yeah, so, mind control, yeah. kind of like you know what we see in, in the military. To um, bring camp. them to a mystic state where they can channel the gods and have different personalities. And, An altered state of consciousness. Exactly. Right, yeah. based on physical trauma. Mm-hmm. So, throughout the movie, the little boy is carrying some kind of Native American doll that looks like a Hopi Kachina doll. And when they're looking at slides at Grandma and Grandpa's house, they mention the times they went to visit reservations. So, here's a foreshadowing that the grandparents are not all what they seem either. So, mm -hmm. this is kind of a generational thing. Uh, Se generational, secret identities, right? Yeah, and generational witchcraft. Right. Right. So, in the movie... Um, Sheen hires this housekeeper nanny who also practices Santeria and she casts a love spell on him so he falls for his landlady. Remember that? Now, yes, I do. But mm -hmm. I also remember that Jimmy Smith gets mm -hmm. the shits. <laughs> he gets snakes in his belly. In his so, <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, what we can derive from this is that if you get an upset tummy it's because somebody put a booty curse on uh -huh. and so jimmy smith is like holding his stomach in this mm -hmm. one scene and he's uh, saying this um word brujeria over and over again right brujeria brujeria and he's like they took my badge and now they have my shield and they have something that is attached to me and in magic if you have something that is attached to somebody you can uh affect them through mm -hmm. this object right mm-hmm and so they're trying in the movie to make a, a distinction about the Bruharia and white, well, you know, uh, innocent, more innocent Santeria, which the landlady personifies. And um, so the housekeeper is using this good Santeria and she senses that the boy is in some need of some spiritual protection and she starts to incorporate some of the paraphernalia into his room yeah i remember that yeah mm -hmm. and this makes martin sheen mad right and so there's a scene where sheen and his girlfriend go to this elite party and there's like law enforcement there and government and politicians and there's yes the, the upper crust who yeah. all, are all seeking to be possessed in this ceremony. and yeah and the entertainment of the evening was the ever creepy palo character that uh dark guy with the blue eyes remember that came from africa yeah yeah he did a really good job being creepy by the way um but palo is actually the name of another religion of its own that comes from the congo so they're kind of throwing all these little other things in there um and it actually specializes in the worship of the dead so to be cut in palo is where the initiate um receives certain ritual cuts with a knife on parts of his body yikes yeah mm. So this Palo character uh, does a ceremony at the gala and <coughs> is mounted by the spirits. You see, remember that? Mm -hmm. And he tries to put a spell on Sheen's girlfriend. Right. And his possession is facilitated by the drum beats, which are a staple in conjuring the gods in both Santeria and Voodoo. Right. So mm -hmm. Again, part of the putting you in an altered state of consciousness right. by which you're opening yourself up to influences. Mm-hmm. And each spirit has a <coughs> specific beat that is played to call them to earth to possess someone. Interesting. Yeah. And then um, in Santeria, the spirits are called Orishas. And the author of the um, that book, The Santeria Experience, 
she kind of likens them to Carl Jung's archetypes. Right, which makes sense. Yeah, and it could be that the Arishas are points of contact, she says, that are established within the collective unconscious, and these are separate supernatural entities and are also personifications of forces in nature. So yes, it's I knew not that, just right. hocus pocus, right? There's something going on here that elemental is real. spirits. Yeah. And so just like they're identified with the saints, um, they also represent things like the sea, the rivers, fire, um, the forest, and things like that. And uh, don't forget, now isn't the eldest son, um, they want to kill him Yeah, that's... by the father for the power that they think will be released on the solstice. Now this is a biblical idea, this comes up in either Chronicles or Kings, where one of the pagan kings sacrifices his firstborn. Uh, so that his army will have, he believes, special powers. Right. And so the final act of the movie, we find Sheen discovering that he's caught up in an elaborate plot to sacrifice his own son. Right. Um, to seduce his, or secure his place in the New York elite. And that was actually his in-laws at the beginning mm -hmm. who sacrificed their son, His would be his brother-in-law. So to and, join yeah. the cabal, mm -hmm. you got to be willing to... Sacrifice your get rid of your firstborn, first born. right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, yeah, I, I guess we could. Well, at, in the movie, they say they tell him that the God who gives money and power requires one life from each of us. Mm -hmm. um, and that made me think of all the deaths that occur around pop stars at the time they make it big. Could be, yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about the gay. Mafia, mafia and hip hop, mm -hmm. but there's also another side of that. It seems like um, each of them need to give someone over a friend or a family member because it's just too many to be coincidence. I think. Right, and another for those that might be skeptical of the mystical side of this, there's also a pragmatic aspect to this, which just like the mm, surveillance that might occur at uh, parties involving underage people in sex stuff or prostitution being sur uh, surveilled for people up and coming politicians or whatever uh murder could also be blackmail so in other words the establishment right. can use these things as blackmail regardless of whether uh you know the magical aspect of it is real or not if the person engaging in the actions believes in it um it becomes blackmail for them potential So I wanted to talk just a little bit more about believers, and there's a scene where Sheen comes home and he finds his maid trying to do a cleansing protection ritual on his son, mm -hmm. and he can't escape all of this Santeria, <laughs> and um, there's a little gray head that he breaks out of anger, and this um, is also the little head that's on the cover of the Santeria book that I read. And his name is Alegua, and he is the guardian of the crossroads, and which would be um, Papa Legba in Voodoo, mm. which I talk a lot about also in Weird Stuff too. Right. And I can see why the nanny would be so upset for him to break it. She acts like she he killed a family member because that's how they view these things, right? And um, and there's an incredible amount of detail that goes into making one of these, and I just wanted to share it with you because it's so bizarre um, but in the book uh, the Santeria experience it says typically the head is made by mixing together a handful of earth from seven different places from near a church a major thoroughfare a jail a city hall a hospital the crossing of four roads and a bakery to this earth are added three of the herbs of the seven pieces um, of tree branches that belong to Alegua and to the mixture is added um, more rocks and the head of a turtle and some special powder and 29 coins of various denominations obtained from seven different stores so there is so much going into making just this little head which they view as the god incarnate right there mm -hmm. in their home and they offer it candies and candles and even blood so um there's a scene in the believers where he goes to this one Santero for protection and they go down in the basement where he has the ritual with the head and he has to slay a rooster and you know 
put the blood all over himself and it gets on his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. You remember that in the bloomers? Right. Yeah, so in Santeria and Voodoo, the killing of animals is a staple and common practice. Right. That's not Hollywood made up. And the power, <clears throat> they say the power of the Orishas is called the Ashe and is ga- granted by giving them energy in the form of thought. An offering of energy in the form of liquor, food, money, candles, and blood. Wow. And so they say that they absorb the energy <laughs> of the offerings and use it to create anew. And of all the offerings, the blood is the most potent. So to be fair, um, most of the animals killed in Santeria are also eaten by them. Right. Um, well, um, Unless they have used it to... Uh, cleanse you or take a negative spirit away from you then they would bury it in the forest right? in, in my version of voodoo we have papa legume <laughs> and he's a bean a bean head right and uh-huh. but he represents not little gray heads but toes Yum. so we paint the little legumes up to be toes and we paint little toenails on them and then we place them at all doorways because toes naturally come through doorways oh good point and so if someone evil comes through all their toes disappear (laughs) see i learned so much from you (laughs) papa legume (laughs) but um yeah so i didn't know that they they were cooking and eating these animals but so the author of this book is saying that they have done this for thousands of years and even the you know jehovah in the old testament required this type of blood sacrifice by animals and um of course you know when jesus died on the cross he was the perfect sacrifice so that's why we don't have to do that anymore mm-hmm. but um alistair crowley talks about blood sacrifice and even human sacrifice in magic and theory and practice so the idea being the transference of the energy mm-hmm. the life force right exactly and so <clears throat> the end of the movie is really good because he thinks it's all over and he's rescued his son from the evil cabal of the New York City elite mm-hmm. um, when they try to sacrifice him and he moves out to the country with his new wife and she's pregnant and they're having a happy time and all of a sudden he goes into the barn and he finds this giant elaborate uh, offering ritual to the gods of Santeria and mm-hmm. his wife walks in and say now we'll be protected so there's no way out for Martin Sheen and the <laughs> believers. Yeah, interesting because... She's now a believer. Right. Right. Uh, The film was made by John Schlesinger, who also did Midnight Cowboy, which is interesting. And if we look at the comments and articles that were written on the the movie at the time, it it was influenced by the satanic panic of the 80s, which is interesting. And it was also... <clears throat> drew from films like Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby, and it would influence The Serpent and the Rainbow, which we're going to do here in a minute. Exactly. So, a lot of, uh, you don't have a whole lot of options. You know, I actually thought there would be a lot more voodoo movies when we were thinking about doing an episode on this. And then you go and look, there's actually not that many voodoo movies. There's mm-hmm. not very many. Now, I mean, there's probably like a bunch of really, really crappy ones that you could find right. from the There's a lot of B voodoo movies. Right, right. but mm-hmm. big screen theater release voodoo movies, you've only got like a handful. Mm-hmm. So I think we're covering all the, all the major ones here. Yep. <clears throat> the film was, I don't know the production cost, so it's hard to say if it was a financial success, but it did bring in about 18 or 19 million dollars which is not too great in the 80s but probably not a failure so it probably did okay but yeah that was uh that's interesting but so the true believer is then really the fundamentalist of any religious movement and in the film's narrative this is what gives it the power so they're I guess finally convinced at the end of the film that it's real right yeah she's been made a believer and now he is too Um, But, yeah, all in all, I think it's a really good commentary on the social structure of the power class, and Mm -hmm. I'll give it five headless roosters. (laughs) (laughs) I give it five Papa Legume (laughs) beans that represent toes. Uh, Don't forget, too, that the youth 
group that they're working with that they're getting the people to sacrifice they're blame they're saying that they're drug addicts and overdosing when they're sacrificing them exactly and and one of the power players in new york in the movie had to sacrifice his son and make it look like a drug overdose right uh but it calls to mind things like dave mcgowan's book program to kill which deals with ritual murder and it brings to mind the franklin cover-up where they were getting children from boys town Mm mm-hmm so, uh, what's the next film we're going to do? Um, Serpent in the Rainbow okay. by Wes Craven. And what year is this? This is 80s also. <laughs> okay. We'll look and see exactly. I think I've got it here. Serpent in the Rainbow is 1988. Yeah. Wes Craven, the so a master, year later. master of yuck movie gross out. Mm-hmm. And let's see. So this one is cool because it's about classic Haitian voodoo, which is a little different than Santeria, but all these religions um, have commonalities. and The old-time religion. Mm-hmm. And they also have things in common with Kabbalah mm-hmm. and Buddhism and Masonry and Gnosticism. Mm-hmm. Naturally. And one of these um things they have in common is that the creator god in santeria is called alurun alofi and in voodoo he's called bondi and since this god is unreachable the people who practice voodoo pray to him to or to his emissaries Mm -hmm. um called the loa and so in santeria it's orisha and in voodoo haitian voodoo they're called loa okay and some celebrities who have been rumored to practice voodoo and Santeria are J Lo. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned that in my analysis of the cell. Uh huh. And the Obamas, well, actually his mother in law. Right. Got, I caught, remember that. Yeah, yeah. embarrassing um, Obama by doing Santeria in the White House. So if you thought you had an Weird embarrassing mother in law, just feel bad for Obama. But, and then I listened to Beyonce's new album called Lemonade, and she talks about trying to change fasting for 60 days, wearing all white, and abstaining from mirrors and sex, which are all elements of Santorian voodoo initiation. Oh, so be- Beyonce is onto the, the voodoo. Mm-hmm. Which brings us to rock and roll, because... But donk says... Badonk donk. Um, it brings us to rock and roll because probably the most famous story that has voodoo elements is the story of Robert Johnson. Mm-hmm. When he went to the crossroads to sell his soul for talent ever since people who play rock and roll have felt like... But that's before he learned karate from Mr. Miyagi, right? Right. Are you thinking of... It's Ralph Macchio that plays <laughs> Robert Johnson in the movie. Oh, okay. And then he goes to learn karate because the devil screwed him over. I never seen that movie. You never seen Karate Kid? No, the one he plays Robert Johnson. <laughs> that was like Ralph Macchio's first movie. Oh. But yeah, anyway, the people who play rock and roll are always claiming that they are possessed by another spirit. Um, and one of the first scenes in Serpent the Rainbow, which I thought that title was interesting because the serpent represents earth in voodoo and the rainbow is heaven and then zombies which this movie is all about mm-hmm. are trapped in between and a lot of people don't know that zombies come comes out of voodoo right mm-hmm. and one of the first scenes you have baron samity in it and he's carrying a flaming coffin through the streets of haiti mm-hmm. and an interesting attribute of him is that he's supposed to be grandmaster of freemasonry among the dead if you look at his sigil or veve, which they call it, there are two little compass and squares on it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. By the yeah. way, that was a joke. Ralph Macchio can't play Robert Johnson because he's not a black guy. But in oh. the movie Crossroads, Ralph Macchio, oh, I guess gets possessed by or he's obsessed with uh, Robert Johnson. Well, we should watch that one because Britney Spears also has a movie called Crossroads. The little head we were talking about before, mm-hmm. uh, Alegua is also Papalegba, mm. who's the god of the crossroads, who is also would be like Mercury, because he's the messenger of the gods and the opener of all the portals. Right. So, Serpent in the Rainbow is fun because we get to talk about one of pop culture's favorite topics, which is zombies. Mm-hmm. Everywhere. <laughs> yes. And I especially like this one because it draws some parallels between voodoo and the pharmaceutical industry. 
And now I wish... This is that movie, Night of the Walking Dead. No, Serpent in the Rainbow. I'm making a joke. Oh. <laughs> There's no movie, Night of the Walking Dead. Okay. <laughs> um, I wish there were better pictures. 28 Zombies. Mm-hmm. In that one. That's not a movie. <laughs> <laughs> 28 Zombies Later. <laughs> And then 280 zombies later. Mm -hmm. And then 28,000 zombies later. That's 20,000 zombies under the sea. <laughs> okay, 20,000 zombies. <laughs> um, What's that one with Brad Pitt? The zombie movie? Oh, the one with the big wall? Wor wor World War Z. World War Zombie, mm -hmm. not Z. It's mm -hmm. World War Zombie. Mm -hmm. It was a zombie jamboree. <laughs> okay, good song. <laughs> Keep going. Um, But... I it's funny because I, well, I wish there were better pictures of this, um, but one time we were in New York City and the film festival we happened to be at was located right next door to the Pfizer Pharmaceutical Building. And in the lobby, there are giant mosaics of all things magical and esoteric. So if anyone lives in New York City, that would be a fun thing to do is go get some pictures and post them on Jay's Facebook to see what I'm talking about because they're really bizarre and just as good as a, a Denver International Airport or something if they'll let you take pictures Don't of it. Don't tell them to post them on Facebook. Now I'm going to oh. get zombies with big dicks hanging no, out. No, we were talking about I'll the... have zombies with tits having sex. The and... Pfizer building in New York. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but Serpent in the Rainbow starts with Bill Pullman down in the Amazon looking for drugs he can take back to the U.S. Right, I remember that, yeah. And he gets this drink from a shaman, and he's like, thank you very much. But the shaman is like, no, you have to drink some now. So he kind of has an ayahuasca trip where he meets his spirit animal, the jaguar. I remember that, yeah. But What's your spirit animal? Um, Probably a hummingbird. Mine's an earthworm. I think you're I'm a... I'm joking. <laughs> a blue whale. Mm. Yeah. But, um... <laughs> It's interesting because as he's being pulled into the underworld on this ayahuasca trip by the the villain named Pedro, it looks very much like Alice in Wonderland tumbling through the earth. And he also has a premonition of this scary guy who did just as good as a scary voodoo guy as in The Believers, I think. Mm -hmm. The guy yeah. that played Pedro, right? And when Bill Pullman gets home, he's hired to go to Haiti to investigate a drug used to create zombies, so... He can bring it back and they can use it for mass production as a type of super anesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're, so literally we're getting from this movie that the big pharmaceutical companies are literally making everybody into zombies, which exactly. is what I always point out in Brave New World. Right. And um, this movie is also based on a book and the mm -hmm. author Wade Davis is an explorer in residence for National Geographic. And this is the genre of nonfiction, so it'd be fun to read the book and watch the movie and see what's real and what's not. But anyways, he said that, you know, he gets paid to go to these exotic places and bring back <clears throat> drugs so they can use them on the population, mm, right? And fun. create zombies, and it's funny because... Well, that's where MKUltra comes from, mm -hmm. with uh, Gordon Lawson and these different uh, banking executives who got the idea to go down to south of the border mm -hmm. and find all the Mayan Aztec secrets about how you become a priest and torture your people with hallucinogenic drugs. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it was funny that the company in the movie called BioCorp wanted to call the drug Zombinol because I have a fake ad in my first book about antidepressants and pharmaceuticals called Zombitol. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and I, I called it that because I think that those drugs together with like birth control pills and things are the what's contributing to the zombification of people in real life and the diet mm -hmm. all of it it's all of it and mm -hmm. the wi-fi and everything but um at the same time there in the movie there's a revolution of the overthrowing of the president of haiti jean claude duvalier who was nicknamed baby doc who the son of papa doc right who was living the lifestyles of the rich and famous while the country was one of the poorest and if you look him up on wikipedia uh his religion is voodoo yeah it's a right. it's a not a secular state it's a theocracy mm -hmm. <laughs> under the devil and if uh you look at uh papa doc you can find 
pictures of him with, I believe, Nelson Rockefeller hanging out. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I thought it was interesting that the two drugs that they're talking about in this movie, one's called tetrodotoxin, which mm -hmm. uh, this comes up in another movie, Captain America Winter Soldier, where uh, Samuel L. Jackson uses it to fake his death. Interesting. Um, and oh, yeah. the little thing, it says oh, yeah, tetrodotoxin B on it. Right. Go ahead. And um, scopolamine. Oh, yeah. I was, you know, I was showing the picture here with uh, Papa Doc Duvalier and Nelson Rockefeller. Mm. So when Bill Pullman gets to Haiti, he meets up with the doctor, uh, Marielle, and they go looking for this zombie named Kristoff. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where they go to a dance ceremony, a party thing, a zombie jamboree. And all the people who are possessed are eating glass and stabbing themselves and stuff. And they ask the lady doctor if she was going to dance that night. And she says no, but when she tries to walk away, someone blows some powder in her face. And then she joins the dance. So th this could be the scopolamine right. drug, right? Something mm -hmm. that makes you really suggestible to things. Right. So this is the part that is one of the main purposes of voodoo and Santeria is to actually become possessed by the loa or spirit. And the host person, they say, is mounted by the god literally like a horse is mounted and controlled by a human. Mm -hmm. And in this case, she was channeling... Um, Erzuli, the goddess of love, and who who they identify in the movie with the Virgin Mary. Mm. And then what else? This is what I actually think is happening when a musician says he's taken over by another spirit. And how many pop stars have said that? You know, John Lennon, Eric Clapton, Santana said he channeled Metatron. Yeah. Um, Beyonce says that she's taken over. Um, and then Ryan he, Wilson, Beach Boys. Mm-hmm. By the way, I meant to men uh, mention too that I just um, it reminds me that a, the reason that Nelson Rockefeller is down there meeting with Papa Doc Duvalier in real life is because Rock Nelson was kind of the head of the CIA's psyops in Latin America. Yeah. So anyway, proceed. Well, this just made me think of um, Eminem too, who says he's possessed by a spirit called Rain Man who in Santeria would be um, Chango. Well, actually, it would be Chango and Yamaya, the sea goddess, together because he brings the thunder. Chango and Cash? Yeah. He brings the thunder and lightning, and she brings the rain. And this also parallels... Um, Here comes the rain again. Ball or Marduk and Ishtar. So right. it goes way back to the beginning of... Time. Yeah, we see these patterns and archetypes mm -hmm. that continue. And the storm god is always worshipped with blood sacrifice and especially child sacrifice if you fail right uh -huh. fall and then this connection between voodoo and rock music is pretty solid because it's again the drum beats that call down the gods right yeah you want to receive your telluric influence from the celestial realms mm -hmm. of the entities so Bill Pullman and the lady doctor meet up with a local witch doctor named Mozart, which I thought was interesting because classical music is much different um, it is, vibrationally and spiritually than... It is, yeah. but Mozart was a high-level mason. That's true, too. Magic flute. Yep. Very esoteric. Um, let's see. Mozart, this witch doctor, is helping Pullman make the zombie potion. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. But not before he's captured by Petro and gets a nail through his balls. You remember that scene? I do. Yeah. Wes Craven is really good at making you cringe and with the yuck movies, right? He's and a yuck man. <laughs> <laughs> yuck, so, yuck. Uh, but this doesn't even discourage him. So he goes out to the wilderness to learn how to make the zombie potion with Mozart. And before he can escape with the potion, he wakes up with this headless lady in his bed, just like the godfather with the... The horse. horse. Yeah. Mm. And he's put back on a plane at gunpoint to go home, but not before Mozart slips him the, the zombie potion he can take home to Biocorp with him. Right. And uh, back home, he's still haunted by the, the witch doctor, Petro, who takes over this lady at a dinner party and tries to attack Bill Pullman. Mm. Right? Yeah. And... So, what does he do? He freaking goes back to Haiti. 
I don't know why, but he feels like he has to... Ballsy Bill. Yeah. Settle this thing. And so when he gets there, he's sprayed with a zombie powder himself and is buried alive. And it's a very scary scene with lots of blood and... Well, my understanding was that the... I watched a documentary on um, zombies and the idea and different voodoo of where it comes from. And what they do is it's basically a mind control technique that the shaman or whoever, Vodun, uh, leads people through. And so they give them the um, toxin and that puts them into a catatonic or altered consciousness state. They bury the person and then allow them to, to come out and the person has gone through this process that makes them think that they're kind of like dead now that they're under the power of the, the Vodun. right so that's why he's you see in the poster of the film you see bill pullman in the casket mm-hmm. good point <clears throat> yeah and so the climax of this movie is pretty silly creepy and very classic west craven again where he has to defeat the Vokor Petro and um, with the help of his animal totem, the jaguar. You remember that? The spirit animal. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And free the souls that Petro has enslaved in jars that he commands from the other side. To... My spirit animal is an eagle because of America. Yeah. My, I'm, I'm half sloth, <clears throat> half hummingbird. Mm. A slothing bird. <laughs> yes. A hoth. <laughs> Yep, and the the freed souls come back and and drag him to hell where he belongs, and then at the end of the movie they're celebrating the overthrow of Baby Doc Duvalier, mm. who of course would presumably be a CIA puppet, given the fact that Nelson Rockefeller is there with his daddy as the CIA agent. So that concludes the next film, Serpent. And the rainbow. One question: Why do you think the title of the movie is Serpent and Rainbow? That is interesting because that Luciferian kind of Blavatsky imagery of the seven rays of the serpent. Exactly. Well, the rainbow has a lot of esoteric meaning, but um, just strictly in voodoo in that religion, the rainbow is heaven and the earth, or the serpent is the earth. Mm, and it makes perfect sense. Yeah. The zombies are in between. Lucifer or the Satan being the spirit of the earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, because he's fallen. Also, the spirit of the air, but. So, you've been listening to Jay's analysis, Esoteric Hollywood, as we break down uh, several of the top Hollywood voodoo movies. And if you want to hear part two of this, be sure and subscribe at jaysanalysis.com for $4.95 a month or for $60 a year, where you can hit 